haven't had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Tyler. I'm the youth pastor here. Uh, it's a joy to be with you this morning. And if you're new here and you didn't get a visitor basket, it's my fault because I forgot to buy the stuff for them this week. So, Marsha, I apologize to you and all of you that are new. Um, please, if you see us in the next couple weeks, remind us and we have a gift basket for you. So, um, just a joy to see so many new faces this morning. A quick update, uh, Ken Graham lifted up this morning the Ignite Conference. It's a youth ministry conference that takes place at a few different locations. There's one in Des Moines, one in Chicago, one in Colorado Springs. Uh, kind of started in Des Moines with a desire for um, professors and biblical scholars and pastors to come together and to spend a weekend kind of intensively discipling student leaders so that they might go back to their home churches and then be leaders in their home churches. We've taken students the last three years. This year we took a group of uh, about 15 and gosh it was amazing. There's over 2,300 students from all over the country just gathering together and being poured into by Bible scholars, by preachers, by seminary professors, just training them up and how they might come back and lead at their own churches and in their own communities. One example of that is since last year's Ignite Conference, some students of our church have been attempting to start a Bible study club in their high school and... Um, they hit some roadblocks in, in the last year, but they came to me at the end of this year's Ignite Conference with a renewed fire and with a renewed passion and even with some knowledge that I did not have myself, and now um, we're looking to hopefully get that started here in the next couple weeks. So uh, just praise God for that. And we did, if you were here last week, you'll know we got stuck in Des Moines because of a snowstorm. My in-laws were gracious enough to let um, 12, I think we had at that point, high schoolers just sleep on their basement floor, so praise God for that. And that night was actually great. We got to sit around together, debrief from the conference, and um, just pray for the hearts of their classmates that they might be softened as they prepare themselves to go plant gospel seeds in their school. So that's the Ignite Conference, and um, again, yeah, just thank you to all of you. Your generosity is part of what allows us to do things like that with our students, so thank you. As we dive this week into the next chapter in the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to see here that Jesus has moved from issues that are primarily internal, such as lust or anger, to issues that have both internal and external consequences, specifically prayer, fasting, and charity. Now you'll know if you've been here for any period of time throughout this series that we're taking very deep dives at very small chunks of the Sermon on the Mount, and so we're going to cover a number of different topics today. And of course we can say that prayer and fasting and charity are internal practices as well as external, but Jesus is referencing this morning as he confronts the Pharisees both their inward and outward expressions, similar to how uh, he connected lust to looking with our eyes and anger to uh, at being the same as committing murder. He's going to focus in specifically here in the next section of the Sermon on the Mount on things like prayer and fasting and charity. It's as if Jesus is trying to lead us to a truth that underlines the entirety of Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6, and that is this. Motivations matter to God. Motivations matter to God. And so if you're a sermon title person, uh, this morning is gospel motivations. And I think motivations matter to us too. I remember once sitting in a philosophy class in college and we were talking about whether motivations matter or to what extent the means can justify the end. And I'm not kidding, a kid who I knew to be a member of the school's socialism club, and I went to a small school at the time, so you knew pretty much everyone on the campus, right? And there, there's this guy sitting in the back of our philosophy class from the socialism club and he speaks up from the back of the room and he says... Well, I think if the result is good, then the motivation doesn't really matter. Like, in Italy in the 1940s, Mussolini increased school enrollment rates to nearly 100%. And I saw people in the class nod their heads for a second, and then I think to myself, like, the fact that he wanted to educate people better so that they could just take over the free world is just like a footnote to you or something? Motivations 
matter to God, and they matter to us too, right? A, a less threatening example is this phenomena that I've experienced now that I'm several years out of high school, and maybe you've experienced this as well. I'll get phone calls and Facebook messages from people that I was friends with in high school, people that I haven't talked to in a while, and they always start out so innocently, right? Hey, Tyler, how have you been? What are you up to now? Congratulations on getting married, that kind of stuff. And then I'm, I'm just feeling really good. I'm, I'm joyful that somebody from my past cared enough about me to reach out to me, and I'm excited that we're having this conversation. And so I, I ask the same question back to them. Hey, what are you up to now? And then this is the answer, something along the lines of, well, that's actually part of the reason I'm calling. I just started working at Northwestern Mutual, and I'd love to sit down with you and Bailey and talk to you about your financial future. Oh, there it is, right? The real reason you called. And listen, I can't fault the guys for trying to make a living, but the warm fuzzies of seeing their name pop up on my caller ID, they went away the moment that I realized that the conversation wasn't about me, it was about my money, right? We all know these kind of things to be true, that motivations matter to us. But this morning, Jesus does something that I think think none of us are always a fan of, and that's he calls us to look inward at our own motivations. Because we're happy to judge others, or at least I know this to be true of myself, we're happy to judge others on a regular basis about the, their actions and their motivations, but when it comes to ourselves, we're, we're quick to look at our own motivations and our subsequent actions through rose-colored glasses, but Jesus is instead handing us a magnifying lens or a microscope this morning, uh, giving us an opportunity to focus in on our motivations. So if you have your Bibles, just a short chunk of, sermon, of, of Scripture this morning, or it'll be up on the screen for you as well. We'll be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. This is Jesus speaking again, continuing in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. A little context, if you uh, read the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see that throughout his Gospel account, his target audience is largely Jewish. And that's important because it gives us insight into why he recorded certain th teachings that the other Gospel writers might not have recorded in their entirety. And so Jesus is not only speaking to an audience that's largely Jewish, but Matthew is recording these events and presenting them to people that are mostly Jewish. And he's noting specifically how the standards that have been set by the Jewish religious leaders actually fail to live up to God's standard. And what he's doing is he's, he's really kind of getting after them now. In, in, a, in youth ministry terms, in a youth ministry way, things that I wouldn't say on a Sunday morning, I would say he's coming into their living room right? He's, he's not content to just stand out on the front porch and talk to you about how you need to live differently. He's stepping into their home, into who they truly are deep down. And if there are any Pharisees in the audience that weren't already mad, when Jesus starts this section in Matthew chapter 6, now they're seething. Because he shifted to the most important personal practices of holiness and piety within Judaism. That's charity, fasting, and prayer. That was the, the holy trinity of righteous living in first century Judaism. And he's going straight to the top of their religious pyramid, their religious observance hierarchy, and he's saying, you guys can't even get this right. Because when we look at the motivations of the Pharisees, and if, if Pharisee is not a word that's familiar to you, that's okay. They're the religious leaders within the Jewish community of the day, kind of like 
pastors within the Jewish sub-community within the Roman Empire, but they're also like city council members. They enforce religious rules because they've got a real level of authority within their community. And their authority didn't come from a place of force, but a place of influence. People wanted to do what the Pharisees told them to do because they believed that in doing so, they were going to obey God better. And so Jesus is making a point to those people who were the religious influencers of the day, you guys are getting the most important things wrong. One scholar calls the Pharisees the fashion models of religious righteousness in their day. Honor and prestige were the most important qualities that one could have, and the Pharisees had the most honor and the most prestige because people gave it to them. They were the examples for how to live righteously or to live the way that God would want you to. But then Jesus, who we know to be part of the Godhead, shows up on the scene and says, those Pharisees, those people that you look up to, they're not as righteous as they seem. In fact, if you truly want to serve God, you should do the opposite of what they do. And this is not a topic of this sermon, but just as an aside, when we look to people as an example on how to follow Jesus more than we look to Jesus himself, we're setting ourselves up to fail. Leaders are great Mentors are good. I love a good God-honoring example from the pastor as much as the next person. But how many pastors have we heard of recently that mess up in some kind of way, whether it be morally or from a leadership standpoint, they mess up, they do something they shouldn't, and then people leave the church and they go on podcasts and TV shows and YouTube videos and talk about deconstructing their faith when their faith was never really in Jesus in the first place, it was in their pastor. Jesus says, do not practice your righteousness in front of others or blare trumpets when you give to the needy so that you'll be honored by others as the hypocrites do, for they have received their reward. Is Jesus saying here that we should avoid doing good things if other people are around? Of course not. He's certainly not telling you to avoid giving to the needy because someone's standing behind you. But he is saying that if the church isn't the first place that people in our community know that they can go when they're struggling, then we're doing something wrong. Financial struggles or otherwise. I'm not not saying uh, what you might be thinking right now. We're not a bank. We're not a handout service. How do we really know what they're going to use that money for? Listen, those are valid concerns And we have systems in place to ensure that we're not enabling bad behavior. But at the end of the day, Jesus called us to be generous, and we have to stop using that as an excuse to not be generous. Even more than money in a place like Centerpoint, Iowa, the supreme currency in our lives, in most of our lives, is time. Would you give up your routine? Or sacrifice something on your schedule to help someone in need with a ride or across the street or to carry something heavy. And listen, I'm as guilty as the next person. If it's anything short of a baby trapped under a car and I'm in a hurry to get somewhere, then I'm not stopping for anyone. But have you ever gotten out of your car and just asked the guy holding the sign for money to tell you about his life? Maybe offer to pray for him? Again, full transparency, the last time I did that was because I had to do it as an assignment for class last semester, and it was a conversation that I'll never forget and that I know brought joy to someone who was just having a rough go of it. And so regardless of who's around, Jesus is calling us to a a different type of generosity, Not, not the easy generosity of giving of things that we already have, but a generosity that requires sacrifice. Maybe money isn't really an issue for you, but time is. Or maybe money is an issue for you, and yet Jesus is calling us to give sacrificially out of the things that we hold dear. The word that Jesus uses here in Greek that we translate as hypocrite literally means an actor. 
like a stage actor or an actor in a play. These people who are supposed to be the examples of righteousness and following God, they're acting as if they're in a play so they can receive the praise of an audience. It's as if they're wearing a mask that looks righteous and pious on the outside when underneath their eyes are scanning the crowd for approval and recognition. But Jesus' response to them is that they'll get exactly what they're looking for, but nothing else. Have you ever been in a situation where you get exactly what you want, but then realize that you could have had so much more? Jesus says to the Pharisees, you will get exactly the praise and approval you're looking for, and you will get nothing more. I learned the story this past week, actually at the Ignite conference, of of a man by the name of Ronald Wayne. You might have heard that name before, probably not. He worked very briefly, about 12 days with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in 1976 for their company, Apple. And he got so fed up with these two men after less than two weeks of working with them that he sold his 10% stake in their company, Apple, back to them for $800. Today, that same share would be worth over $95 billion. And if you think that's rough you should know that the word translated reward in this passage, Matthew 6, is actually a wage. It's the exact payment you deserve for what you've done, nothing more and nothing less. And so when Jesus says to the Pharisees, you will get your reward, he's saying you will get exactly what you have earned with your giving that is done purely for the approval of others, but you will get nothing else is entrance to the kingdom of heaven and receiving the rewards of heaven not worth more than $95 billion or any amount of money. Ronald Wayne missed out on a lot of money, but people who do, a, who do good for human praise are missing out on much more. God's praise and heavenly reward. And of course, I'm not saying that the motivation behind their charity is what determines whether or not they're saved. We know that salvation comes only through faith in Christ. But Jesus is being very clear here that if your desire is praise from men, then that's exactly what you'll get. But you will lose out on a reward that's worth so much more. Giving for the glory of others does have a reward. But when you compare it to the riches, the glory, the reward that awaits the righteous in heaven, then what kind of reward is human applause? Our God has always been a God of what's on the inside more than what's on the outside. Now, of course, he did make our bodies, and he does care about our bodies. But as an example, if you remember back to the story of David being anointed king in 1 Samuel 16, David's father, Jesse, he goes, he lines up all of his physically appealing sons who he thinks should be the next king. He's got tall sons, he's got strong sons, he's got athletic, good-looking sons, and he lines them all up for the prophet Samuel. And Samuel goes down the line asking God, is this the one who's to be the king of Israel? Is this the one who's to be the king of Israel? Is this the one who's to be the king of Israel? And the prophet Samuel, he's looking at Jesse's huge athletic sons and thinking, surely it's got to be one of these guys here. But how does God respond? In 1 Samuel 16, 7, The Lord says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. They didn't even invite David in for the selection committee. He was still outside tending to the sheep. He was on nobody's radar, right? He's in nobody's March Madness bracket. And yet he's the one that God chose to anoint as king of Israel because it wasn't about what was on the outside. It was about what was on the inside. And so in the same vein in Matthew 6, 
these hypocrites, these play actors, they're not just deceiving other people with their giving so that they can receive human approval. They're deceiving themselves. They make the mistake of confusing human praise with pleasing God. Because underneath that mask is not a man or a woman who thinks of themselves as a prideful attention seeker. It's someone who's convinced themselves that those good feelings they get when people praise them are at all comparable to the glory and praise that awaits them from the Father in heaven. And they're sorely mistaken. Jesus says to us, but you, you are not to be like that. For your reward does not come from people, it comes from God. Jesus doesn't give us the specifics of this reward, but based on the theme of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, it's likely that this reward is both in some ways a present reward or a blessing in whatever way God decides to bless us, and more importantly, it's a future reward in heaven. So even when we see no earthly reward for our giving, we rest and hope in the fact that our heavenly Father sees what is done in secret And that as the only one whose praise truly matters, he is lavishing it on us now and will do so even more in heaven. God sees you giving when you don't think you have anything to give. When the bills are tight, when your schedule's packed, or when you're just at your wit's end with people that just keep seeming to need something from you, brother or sister in Christ, take heart because even the most thankless jobs and the times when your charity looks more like the woman with two pennies than the Pharisees with all the money in the world, your God sees you. When it takes everything that you have to get up in the morning and to serve people, to love your family, to care for your children, to sacrifice for your spouse, when it feels like you can't go another day, your God sees you. Not only are the rewards different based on our motivations, but the result is different as well. Selfish giving seeks to bring glory to the self, while gospel-motivated giving brings glory to God. The theologian Grant Osborne says this about gospel-centered motivations. He says, of course, Jesus does not mean we give only because we want a heavenly reward. We give both because we love God and want to give back to Him a portion of what He has given us and because we care about the plight of the needy. I've used that phrase a couple times already, gospel motivations. I just want to clarify that when we give to the needy, we do so not because it makes us feel good or because we have to, but because we understand that in the deepest parts of our reality, like at the very core of who I am as a human being, deep down in my soul, in my relationship with God, I was more helpless than the poorest beggar who has ever lived, and God died for me so that I didn't have to stay there. When Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, he's talking about the light that is himself, the light of Christ in you that flows out from a heart that's not motivated by selfish gain, but a desire to see the God who saves you praised out of a heart that understands that when it comes to our souls, we were the neediest, the raggiest, the dirtiest beggars of them all, and still Christ died in our place. He gave more than money could ever buy. He gave himself as payment for the sins of his people that they might be cleansed, healed, and reconciled in love to their heavenly Father. That's why we give, because none of this stuff matters at all in comparison to what Jesus has given us. And gosh, if he's called us to give everything to those in need so that they can praise him and so that they might be saved by him, then is it not worth it? Is it not worth sacrificing the things I want to do with my money if other people are saved? Is it not worth sacrificing what I have to with my time so that other broken sinners can be reconciled to God and given life? Isn't giving our money worth it? And isn't giving our time and our efforts and our energy and serving with our spiritual gifts worth it if we get to see just one lost sinner repent and turn to God? 
even when it's difficult, even when giving might mean sacrificing something else, isn't it worth it? In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's essentially telling them a praise, like we do during our praises and prayers, while also giving them a challenge. He says to them that the churches in Macedonia had been giving to support other needy believers even when they themselves were going through a trial. This is 2 Corinthians 8. He says, In the midst of a severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify, they gave as much as they were able, able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own, and they urgently plead pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people, and they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. I'll admit that when I've had a bad day, I'm not always pleading to God for ways to give more of myself or my money to other people. But that's exactly what we're being challenged to do. Can you imagine, Paul says, people in poverty that are literally getting on their knees before the apostles saying, please give us more ways to give you our money. Please give us more ways to give of ourselves. Please give us more ways to give you time that we don't have so we can serve the Lord. One of the reasons that I feel so silly comparing any kind of giving that I might do to what Christ has done for us is that not only did Jesus give himself completely so that we could be saved, but even now he sovereignly helps us to do our own giving too. It's like driving your kid to the store and giving them your credit card so that they can buy you a Christmas present because they really badly want to give you something, but they're five and they don't have any money. So they're going to buy you a gift after you drove them to the store with money that's already yours. Jesus is so sovereignly good to us that he's helping us to give even when all of the stuff that we're giving him is already his. 2 Corinthians 9, 7-11 says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. I'll be totally honest with you. I don't care about your money. I don't know what any of you give. Andrew doesn't know what any of you give. It's it's not about that. It's about a heart that has been so changed, so transformed by the glory of the message of the gospel that we're willing to do whatever it takes that lost people might be saved. That we're willing to do whatever it takes that hurting people that are created fearfully and wonderfully in the image of God might be provided for and cared for and treated with the dignity and honor that they deserve as God's creation. When you give, God is always there, constantly providing for you and using your giving to accomplish more than mere money or time could ever accomplish on its own. But all things, even our giving, must fall underneath his mighty and glorious purposes. I want to close this morning with an example from the text of how Jesus acted towards the needy. For after all, isn't our goal of discipleship the practice and growth of our faith that we would look more like him? Here's the thing. I know what some of you are thinking. I give and I serve in the church a little, so this sermon's not about me. This is not going to sound nice, but I'm saying it because I need to hear it too. Don't pat yourself on the back because Christians are the most charitable group in the United States. Because Jesus wants more than our money. He wants our lives. 
Yes, we should give money to the poor, but Jesus is coming after your time, your comfort, and your very heart because Jesus got down in the dirt with people and that's what he's calling us to do too. In John 8, Jesus is teaching, he's sitting around teaching a group of people and some of those same religious leaders that we've talked about all this morning, they bring to him a woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And it goes like this. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say, Jesus? They were using this question as a trap in order to have basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go and sin no more. The Pharisees, the same hypocrites that we're talking about this morning, the people who it's so easy for us to become, come before Jesus, they drag in a woman who is likely without clothes, caught in the act of adultery, and they say, what do you do, Jesus? What does the law say we should do with her? Because our traditions say that this woman deserves the death penalty. We have to kill her. Look, pastor, this person that we gave money to went out and got drunk last night. This person that comes to youth group went out and had sex with their boyfriend or girlfriend. This person who serves on your church committee blew their money on gambling. What are we supposed to do, Christians? Let's get them. But what does Jesus do? Even the physical posture of Jesus demonstrates His grace and calling to us. What does Jesus do when they come forward with selfish motivation, seeking to make themselves look righteous and trap Jesus with the law? He gets down in the dirt where this woman is. We don't need any more churches. We don't need any more Christians that look at the needy and the broken and the helpless with rocks in their hands and their pockets. We need churches and Christians that are willing to get down in the dirt with, with messy and hurting and broken and sinful people with the grace of Jesus that's been shown to us. We need churches that are willing to get down in the dirt to hold people, to guide them, to love them when they can't love themselves, to give entirely of ourselves because we know better than anyone else that that woman that's down in the dirt was us. Before we knew Jesus, before we were saved, before we were brought into the fullness of life that we're called to live in, that woman caught in adultery who is standing condemned to death was you. Before Jesus saved us out of our sin, we were that needy woman caught in our sin on the verge of death. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords humbled himself to the point of getting down in the dirt for us. He went to a whipping post for us. He tasted the dust of the path to Calvary for us. He shed his blood and experienced the full wrath of God on the cross for us. And when someone in our life was willing to reach out to this needy sinner, that's when we were able to experience the salvation that comes not from the law, not from human recognition or praise or approval, but from the grace of God alone. Is that going to be you, church? Is that going to be me? Are your pockets full of rocks? Are your wages human applause? Or has the unmerited, unearned, undeserved, unconditional grace that sets you free been so impressed on your heart that you're willing to do whatever it takes to bring that grimy, dirty person like you to be washed clean by the blood of Christ? Let's pray.
Lord God, would you so impress upon our hearts to do whatever it takes with our money, with our time, with our comfort. God, would you call me out of the things that I cling to, the worldly things that I seek comfort in, and would you call me to give it all up, Lord, that other broken people might be brought into the love that you've shown me. God, would you make us not a church that's content to just sit within these walls and do nothing, Lord, but to to take the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Lord, would you so change our motivations to not be selfish or greedy, but to reflect the beauty and goodness of the gospel. God, impress that upon our hearts this morning and remind us of the grace and love that's been received through your son, Jesus, alone. We pray these things in his holy and precious name. Amen. Would you please stand for a a word of benediction this morning? Confirmation students, I went six minutes over, so you better be really good for Pastor Mike this morning and get in there. For the rest of you, I pray that you would go in peace this week reminded of the goodness of the gospel message that um, while you were sinner, while you were needy, while you stood accused and ready for the death penalty, that you were saved by a God who loves you more than you could ever imagine. Uh, Would you go in peace with that message motivating you this week? Amen.